uh, I'm Emmanuel Williams, Associate Dean of Student Affairs at Penn State College of Medicine. Uh, and we'll be talking about medical student burnout, definition, recognition, and prevention. And at the uh, after I have spoken, Dr. Kelly Holder, Chief Wellness Officer at the Warren Alpert Medical School um, and Assistant Director of Counseling and Psychological Services at Brown University will be joining us on this call. So the objectives of our talk today are to define burnout, recognize consequences, symptoms, and contributing factors in medical students. And most of our talk uh, applies to American medical school students and then create personalized burnout prevention and treatment strategies. So the definition of burnout, burnout the word actually means reduction of a fuel or substance to nothing through use of combustion. So something we burn, um, but burnout as we are talking about today is the physical or mental collapse caused by professional life. Uh, and in particular to professionals in the medical, in medical system now. The term was actually first coined approximately in the 1970s by Herbert Verdenberger, who was a psychologist and a Holocaust survivor who worked uh, in a very busy practice, but also dedicated a lot of his time to drug addicts and um, patients uh, who had severe mental disease um, due to addiction and with addiction. Um, and at some point he was working so many hours that he was supposed to go on vacation and he couldn't get out of bed. Uh, and his wife said that he just wasn't functioning. And at that time, he thought about how he felt and he remembered seeing drug addicts who were so out of it or not physically and mentally present that they would let their cigarettes burn their fingers. And that's how he felt. He felt that his job had burned him out at that time. Uh, and he ultimately wrote a book that was, uh, was that had burnout in the title. And that's where the term was officially first used. By the numbers in the United States, one out of every two medical students by the time they graduate uh, will have suffered a, some form of burnout. Students enter medical school with a low rate of burnout versus their age appropriate or age adjusted and educationally adjusted peers. The consequences are very severe. Our medical students are three, more, three times more likely to die by suicide uh, compared to peers of the same educational level and students with burnout are two to three times more likely to have considered suicide at some point. There's also a strong association with thoughts of leaving medical school. So in a medical student, there are really significant consequences to suffering uh, from burnout at its worst. What are the causes of burnout? Excessive workload. I think any medical student all over the world understands how much there is to learn in medicine. The loss of autonomy, flexibility, and control. Uh, this is a time where you enter a professional world uh, and you are told many times how to act and also what to learn. Uh, some loss of meaning in work because it takes a lot of time to become a doctor. Um, and sometimes it feels that it's hard to even imagine what it will be like to practice medicine. An inefficient environment, the expectations of medical students sometimes are not as clear as they could be. And students feel they're pulled in many directions on where they have to uh, fulfill their expectations, and then problems with work-life balance. So uh, ma maintaining a normal life outside medical school. I remember my medical school years as if everything was on hold. I didn't go to weddings, I missed family birthdays, um, and this is, not, this is not a healthy way to proceed. Really, when we think of the symptoms of burnout, they can see, be seen in three dimensions emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and low personal accomplishment are the three types of symptoms in all dimensions that we see in burnout. Emotional exhaustion. It's, it's, you see sick patient after sick patient. You're not at a restaurant waiting for people to be happy to go to the restaurant. You are seeing people who are unwell and who want to feel better, but they're unwell when they see you. That can empty your emotional gas tank. You are running on fumes. Depersonalizations, the patients are no longer people. You see them as objects, as diseases, as symptoms. Um, and these are dolls that are called troll dolls in the United States. And when we were medical students, we had a liver service and with the big belly, the levocytes and temporal wasting. Uh, to us, they look like troll dolls. And I remember um, it was uh, not uncommon and completely inappropriate to refer to some of these patients as our troll patients. 
uh, which was really unbelievably inappropriate, but we were so tired and so exhausted that it was in a certain way, perhaps a coping mechanism, but we didn't recognize it at burnout at that time. Low personal accomplishment, uh, you're the little man here, uh, you know, making the machine work, but you feel so small, what you do doesn't matter. And that's easy to feel that way as a medical student. A lot of times people ask me, you know, burnout, stress, depression, what's the difference? What does it really mean? Um, and here, uh, it's important to realize that it is a interrelationship. So stress is really a syndrome of too much. You are doing too much. You're busy, busy, busy studying, running around, um, going on, on wards. Um, it can be productive. We know that when you get stressed right before an exam and you're getting ready to study, um, it, it can motivate you to study. If it's rewarded appropriately and it's valued, it may not necessarily lead to burnout. But when you don't adapt properly to stress, then you can go into a burnout stage. And really burnout is the syndrome of not enough. There's not enough of you to handle everything that's going on outside of you. It's never productive. It doesn't lead to better things or improvement in your career. If anything, it can stall you. Um, and it is related to stress and a maladaptive response. So here, stressed Eric, there's a picture of him, his hair is on end. And burnt out Eric, well, he's so burnt out, he was too tired to pose for the cartoons. He apologized. So burnout, when you leave medical school, and this is really important, um, when, met, when students decide to leave medical school or they graduate from medical school, uh, it can completely resolve. If they change completely of careers, it can resolve. Um, but it does have a relationship with uh, uh, burnout in that 90% of burnt out physicians actually meet criteria for depression. So it has an, a relationship with depression. Um, and we are seeing in the United States epidemic increases as our health systems change um, and, this, and the complexity of our, our, our patients go up. Um, depression is about all your life. You can be depressed whether you're in one job or the other job or one place or the other place. It can be situations, but depression is more all-encompassing. Burnout is truly related to your place of occupation. So the stages of burnout, the first time is it's actions. You're working so hard, you're trying to prove your work, you work harder, you neglect your need, but ultimately it becomes passive. You start to withdraw, you become empty, uh, you depersonalize the patients that you take care of. COVID-19 has made absolutely all of this harder for all of us. The first part of it is fear. Uh, there is a personal concern, a fear that you could bring back the disease that you're getting in contact with to your family. So it's not just you getting sick, but the possibility of passing it on to others. Um, not feeling that you are efficient in the system. How am I really helping as a medical student? We did have COVID response uh, groups in our medical school, and we found that those students who were engaged in that actually seemed to have less burnout in a sense. They were more engaged in the process. They felt they were helping, volunteering to vaccinate, to do testing. Uh, but it, could, it was very easy during COVID-19 when all our classes in the medical school went into the virtual sense uh, that, that medical students felt like they had no role. Um, moral injury, how did it happen? In the United States, we've seen very significant differences in how patients of different socioeconomic backgrounds, racial backgrounds, um, have, have suffered this disease. It's, it's, a real problem in the United States in how we're evaluating our healthcare system that this infection really disproportionately hit some groups. Um, invalidation, you know, in the United States, there were a lot of people celebrating uh, healthcare workers in the middle and the midst of COVID. However, now that we're trying to get vaccinated, uh, people are, are not happy to be, feel like they're getting forced to do something uh, and physicians are no longer valued for what they did. Uh, sometimes people also resent that the reason that we closed everything down was to make sure that our health systems did not get overwhelmed. Um, and they feel that that was a huge sacrifice that was made for physicians, not realizing it was really for patients. Um, and then isolations. Our medical students did incredibly well during COVID here uh, at Penn State. And that's really because we gave them very high standards. It was not just wearing masks. It was everything virtual. It was no get togethers, no study groups a very, very hard time. So it is normal uh, with COVID-19 and we expected it to see 
an increased rate of burnout. But the relief, as much as all the negative things, is that burnout is preventable, it can be treated, and can even be cured 100% of the time if we are good at recognizing it. The most important is to recognize that burnout is a system problem. It's what the system does to you and brings out in you, not an individual's disease, and must be addressed with systemic solutions. So one of my last recommendations before we go on uh, to Dr. Kelly Holder is I recommend that in your medical schools or wherever you are, try to play a role in improving the system so it doesn't give rise to the types of risks that we talked about that give rise to burnout. So I'm now going to hand things over to Dr. Kelly Holder. I'm going to stop sharing my slides uh, and she will be here to continue the rest of the talk. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much. And in full disclosure, Dr. Holder and I were colleagues uh, before she went to another medical school. And I had the pleasure of seeing her incredible work with medical students um, and I, adding light in, in our offices. So thank you so much, Kelly. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I'm glad to have this time to talk with you. Again, I'm um, Kelly Holder. I'm a clinical psychologist and currently I'm at Brown University as the chief wellness officer for their medical school. And I'm also assistant director in their counseling and psychological services office for the university. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and just kind of pick up where Dr. Williams left off, right? Here we go. So the thing I want to highlight is just where we're making this transition and reminding you that burnout is a system problem, right? It's not on us as individuals. There are some systems that create burnout um, more than others. And we know that the healthcare system is one of them. And being a medical student then puts you at risk for burnout. Now we know that it is a system problem and we believe that it is important as individuals we speak out to systems and we make changes wherever we can. However, while those changes are still taking place, there's something that we can do for ourselves, things we can do for ourselves. Um, and that, that brings some hope, right? Partial hope. And so my idea is that it's much better to prevent burnout, right? Than to have to rebuild or recover after it happens. Let me give you just a little bit of context. If we look at the healthcare system, um, there are some occupational hazards of working within healthcare. And I think this is important for you to know as a medical student, as someone entering healthcare system, right? We have biological hazards. And one that we're all familiar with right now is COVID-19. And as a healthcare worker, you put yourself at more risk for being in those spaces where individuals may have that. But other things like TB, hepatitis, HIV, AIDS, SARS, right? There's chemical hazards and physical hazards, ergonomic hazards, such as heavy lifting. We also have psychosocial hazards, right? Such as violence and stress and burnout can fall in that as well. We have fire and explosion hazards, electrical hazards. And according to the World Health Organization, these are the hazards that people have within healthcare settings. And so there's things that we do to mitigate those difficulties. And we say, here, here are some things you can do to protect yourself from being exposed to those things. So today, really what I wanna talk about are ways you can protect yourself or buffer yourself against burnout, right? Again, this is not to negate what systems need to do and what we need to do within organization, organizations to make them more well for individuals. Um, but on a personal level, it's good to know there's something that I can do. And I like this picture here. This is um, a buffer soccer game where you get into these inflatable balls and you play soccer. If you will notice those inflatable balls um, aid when two people run into each other, there's not as much friction, not as much damage. However, you're still at risk for running into someone, for falling, for hurting hurting yourself, but the hurt won't be as bad because you're insulated in that buffer. And that is the nature of which I wanna talk about these skills that I'm gonna to give to you today. All right, so I'm gonna start with the very most basic of skills. And we call these our basic self-care skills. If you notice in the picture, I have a picture of a foundation of a house. 
And if we're talking about building a house that we want to prevent from destroying, being destroyed from a fire, right? Or being burnt out, we want to start at the foundation level. And basic self-care is that foundation level. It's our regular sleep, our diet, our exercise, our hydrating, drinking plenty of water. I know I don't need to give you a lecture on these things because these are the things you already know you need to do to sustain your existence. The challenge is that as a medical student, stuff happens and you don't always get it in, right? And so here's my admonishment to you is to think about your basic self-care as one of the tools that can aid you in preventing burnout and figuring out how can I meaningfully take care of myself on the most basic of levels? How could I put exercise in my life in a sustainable way? It might mean that you don't go to the gym the way you did before you were a medical student, but it may mean that you just make sure you get 10 to 15 minutes in every single day. That's much better than going two or three weeks and then finally getting in a long one hour, one hour and a half workout, right? You kind of see what I'm saying? Find small ways to make sure you're doing those basic self-care. And the more you do in that area, it's gonna increase your resilience or that buffer against burnout. All right, so that's just basic, right? These are things you already know, but I'm just reminding you about. The other thing that's important, and I like to think about this as our walls to our home, is our relationships. As human beings, we are made to be with other people. If COVID-19 has not taught us anything, it's taught us that. Even the most introverted of introverts have said, wait a minute, this was too much. I need to be with other people, right? And while there are restrictions still in place, there are great ways you can still connect with others, like we're connecting with you today virtually. But I want you to think about your relationships on three levels. One, your closest of relationships, your family members, your loved ones, those romantic relationships. You wanna take time to nurture those, right? Hold them close. But not just those, think about your colleagues and your mentors. These are the people who might not know you as well, but they're the people you might spend the majority of your time with. They're people you're going to class with, people you're asking questions of, people you're learning from. Figure out how to invest in those relationships and build those. And then thirdly, your relationship to the world. Connect with causes, volunteer work, community work that's meaningful to you. These relationships that we have aid us in some of the best growing that we do. It also puts in perspective some of the trials and difficulties that we face, especially that you will face as a medical student. And so I want you to think about honoring those relationships. Honor, honoring them allows you to create, again, this buffer around yourself. These are the people who will remind you about who you are, your place in the world, what's of most value to you. And, and this is highly beneficial, again, because we wanna increase that buffer. The next thing that I wanna encourage you to do is making sure that you have good meaning for your life. This is like existential stuff. It's like the most biggest of questions, but what I'd like to do is take that big question and distill it down into the day, into the moment. Now, some of the ways we do that is by knowing and identifying our own values. What do you value? What is important to you? Are you a hard worker? Are you kind? Are you honest? Are you um, supportive of others? Do you like laughter? Um, is it good to investigate? Do you like solving problems? Take some time to write down what you value about yourself and what you like to bring to the world. And then that pull it into the day. Um, even at the beginning of the day, you can write an intention or something around your value. One of my values is um, being a thankful or a person who uh, sees good in things. And so, Sometimes when things get really difficult, I remind myself, is there something I can be thankful for in this moment? By bringing gratitude into it, it helps me get through those moments because I'm bringing my own value into that moment. As a medical student, everything you do is not gonna feel really important to you, right? And some of the things are gonna feel really draining and really challenging. But if you can bring your own values into that and say, what can I pull from this experience that adds to the value of my life? It's gonna help you be more resilient or create that buffer, right, for burnout. Because we talked about some of those symptoms and one of the symptoms really seeps away at our values and meaning, so that's important. The other thing is identify your why. Why, capital Y, as far as why are you in medical school anyway? 
What do you want to add to the world? Why would being a physician for you and your family and your friends and your community be really important? Identify that, write it down, get it on paper. And then also identify your little why, right? Because being a medical student isn't all who you are, right? You're so much more, so much more of a person and so many other elements in your life. Remind yourself about those too, because those things matter, right? And as you, you um, figure out how to make time for those other whys, it's going to balance out or um, aid you in better managing the challenges that come with being a medical student and someone going into healthcare and becoming a physician. This next one I think is really important. We want you to re resist this delayed gratification and putting life on hold. This is not to say that you get to do everything you absolutely have always wanted to do while you're in medical school, but I want you to find ways of pulling in the things that are most important to you into your daily life. One of my uh, favorite things to kind of talk about is some people who are really into art. Um, maybe they like to paint and paint large murals and do a lot of really extravagant artwork. Well, maybe medical school doesn't allow you to do that. However, you can do it on a small scale. Get small projects. Do a little something every day. Something to remind you about how valuable that is to you and that you still can offer it to the world. Maybe not on the large scale, but on a smaller scale. And we could do that with anything. Vacationing, traveling. You can make a book or archive and put pictures together and plan for events. Making small trips, again, with COVID, that kind of changes things a little bit. But even just planning and thinking about it and writing things down is one way we can pull it into our present. Again, we don't want to put off everything until we become something because there's always something to become. So we want to be able to enjoy our lives because the way we do that now typically will be how we do it for the remainder of our lives. And so getting that good practice now is very important. This last one is practicing gratitude. I kind of highlighted that already, but what I want to remind you is that gratitude changes everything. When we are able to find something we can be thankful for in the midst of difficult and challenging things, while it doesn't get rid of what is painful and difficult, it shifts our perspective just enough so that we can bear what's necessary so we can move forward. And if you don't have a gratitude practice and you've never done it before, I would challenge you to think about just maybe starting your day or ending your day, listing two to three things that you're thankful for and just see how it impacts your life. Try it out and see, it's simple enough. Lastly, when I talk about the top of our house or the roof, these are stress reduction techniques. These are on top of basically taking care of ourselves, having good relationships, knowing our meaning and value, learning some tools that can reduce our own activation. And so there's all kinds of things. It's learning mindfulness. This is just around being present where we are and enjoying the moment. And there's all sorts of great mindfulness skills that you can learn. Meditation. I like this one because it is all about noticing what you are focusing your mind on. And so there are meditation practices where you can sit and focus on your breathing, focus on phrases, focus on goodness. But throughout our day, we're always thinking about something. And a good friend of mine just reminded me that worry is a kind of meditation and that's not the kind of meditation we want in our lives, right? So when we notice where our thoughts are going on a regular basis, being able to take hold of them and saying, really, is this where I wanna spend my mind, my mental energy, right? And, and then deciding, okay, this is how I'm gonna spend my thinking time. This is where my thoughts will be. This is what I'll focus on. It's really important. Then there's cognitive restructuring. This is all about how we think, learning how to have better perspective. Um, there's all sorts of tools and I could give a whole lecture just on this in and of itself, but it's something worth investigating because the way we think matters and it impacts our behavior and our emotions. It's good stuff, a way to focus in on. Another thing that can help reduce our stress is to nourish our own creativity. And this is just not about art and singing and music and dance. Creativity is all about making something new, putting things together. So my friends who like to organize, while I think that might not be a fun way to spend my time, they are using their creativity. They're plotting and planning and getting 
tools and different things to put things together and make it all look nice in a space, right? That's creativity. So for you, it could be solving problems. Um, it could be the artsy things. I say this because some of you really like the work that you do and really like studying. And so some of the things that you study, you can, if you um, know that you're using your creativity, you can remind yourself that even while I'm studying this thing and doing this, this could be a mode of stress reduction for me because I'm enjoying it so much and I'm using my mind to put the information together in a brand new way and share it with someone else. I like to say this because we sometimes dichotomize our work and our play. And sometimes our work is our play. If we're mindful of it, we can use that to our advantage. And again, create this buffer around ourselves for our, from burnout. The last one I think is really important. We're in a digital age, and especially since COVID, I really used to be technology kind of free a lot, like not on my phone, decrease my social media use. But with the increase of COVID and staying at home, my temptation to get on was much greater because I, that was the way I could connect with people. I do know that having those tools to connect with others is really important, but we have to be mindful in the ways that we're using them, making sure that we're just not zoning out on technology or we're too available to too many people too much of the time. I think we don't fully understand what it does to our brains and our bodies. So it's important that we all take some break from being um, constantly uh, contacted by others and constantly taking in information. It can be information overload. I also highlight the idea that because of COVID and all the things that have happened over this last year and a half, there's a lot of bad news and we don't have to take it in all the time, right? It's okay for us to take a break. It's not gonna change what's happening in the world. We owe ourselves the moment of peace and a moment of being away from the incessant bad news to take care of ourselves. And so if that resonates with you, then make sure that you schedule some time to be technology free so that you have to don't have to constantly take in that kind of information. So here's the house that we prevented the fire from and uh, we've taken really good care of. If I were to give you any suggestions on how you can increase your own buffer and prevent burnout in your life, these are the steps I would share with you. One, identifying what your go-to coping skills are. I shared some here with you. I might have shared some things you might wanna try, but my guess is that you already have skills that work well. It's just realizing whether you use them or not and then figuring out how often you want to use them. So do a self-assessment, what works for you, right? Use that stuff, do it. You have a lot of wisdom and I want you to gather from the wisdom that you have to best help yourself. The second thing is that we all have some negative or maladaptive coping skills, some things that take away from the goodness of our lives. If we just go to the basic coping, um, basic care area, um, one of the things that could work negatively against us is consuming too much alcohol, right? We know that negative health effects it has on our bodies and that it has on our minds. And so, you know, being mindful of that. So what are the negative coping skills that you might be using too often? that at some point it helps you feel good, but too much, it causes you to have negative effects. Realize what those are and, and remove those from your life as much as possible. And then decide what new skills do you want to add to your life, slowly and mindfully. Again, there's no goodness in making a long list of all these new things you're gonna do. That, you could get burnt out on trying to do wellness stuff, right? So. It's important that you start slowly and you add maybe one or two new things that you might wanna try. Give it a chance to seep in, give it a chance to really work for you, and then decide if you want to add something else. Again, you don't have to do a ton of things to increase that buffer around you, but doing something does help. So some of the examples can be relaxation, right? Setting daily intentions that are based on your values improving your thinking and perceptions, increasing your social and professional support. This one can be really valuable while you're in medical school. 
regularly practicing gratitude, and then find new purposeful ways to refuel yourself. After you get through a day and you feel drained, how do you then get that energy back again to start and do the whole day again, right? What are those things that refuel you? Um, I know that I have a little routine that I do every morning and I do it whether I want to or not, but I always feel better after I do it. So it's important you identify what those things are for you and then just put them into place in a sustainable way, right? And then um, the thing I like to talk about a lot, which I didn't spend time in this, this talk talking about is that we also have to extend some compassion to ourselves when we're adding and doing these new things. It just really says, I'm not gonna beat myself up and say, oh, you gotta do all this. It says, with kindness and love, like I would give to a good friend, how could I help myself move forward? And so I hope it is in that mindset that you add these professional resiliency skills to your life. Not in a mean, harsh way, but in a kind, generous way, giving that to yourself, right? And last but not least, asking yourself if you need help with this and who will you ask if you need help, right? Because there's no shame in asking for help. This is something that we encourage our students to do, that um, seeking help and asking others around these things is really important. And I would extend that to you as well. Dr. Williams, would you like to sum up? Or thank you so much, Kelly. I think all of those were wonderful. I was thinking about sometimes when you're thinking about the why in US medical schools, our medical students write an essay to try and get into medical school. And sometimes I tell my students, go back and look at that essay. Why did you want to become a doctor? Those are things that are important to think about. Um, so really some great points there. Um, so again, the key points, this is a system problem. If you're taken out of the system, this is not you that's the problem. This is really about the system that you're in and you're navigating it. It's a difficult world and medicine is not becoming easier. Um, the field we work in puts us at risk. We are working with people when they're not at their best and they're not at their happiest and there are lives at stake. So people are in a more stressful zone in terms of taking care of each other. Um, that is a stressful atmosphere to start off with. Um, it's important that you're able to recognize it. So there are many tests that you can look at. Um, there is a tool that's used for research, which is the Maslow test. But what I ask most students is, do you feel like you have emotional exhaustion? Do you feel like you're depersonalizing what you're doing? Are you forgetting that there are patients there? And then do you feel like you don't matter? And I think if you can answer those questions, and even to one of those, you may have the beginnings of burnout and it's worth addressing. Um, and then it's so important to attempt to prevent it in the first place. And so build that house as best you can. Um, in the United States, I think we have made um, really big moves to help our students. And so uh, Dr. Holder is chief wellness officer that is an actual position uh, and that is very well respected in our medical schools. Uh, we have tried to get rid of very significant competitiveness by having pass-fail tests rather than grading everybody and ranking them in a way. Um, our medical school schools um, are really active in um, national groups and community service um, because we know that's important to students. They feel like they have a role there. Um, and we also have a lot of extracurricular activities. So we take this very seriously because our medical students are the future of our healthcare. Uh, people who work with medical students who are creating the future of our healthcare, and it is really important that these skills are learned in the medical school setting to set you off for your best career possible. I know as a medical student, I was not well prepared for all of these things. I became interested in burnout because I myself felt very burnt out. I, I remember one day um, sitting in a room and really envying the person who was doing the housekeeping because they had a job that was limited, that they knew they could go home to. They weren't overwhelmed by everything they didn't know about all the tests they had. And I realized at that point, I really needed to look into it. And that's when I became interested uh, in the research topic. So thank you so much, um, Kelly. And I don't know if you have any last words, but um, we wish the best for our medical students. We think this is a really important part um, medicine loses out when we have people who are burnt out because they're basically sitting there looking at medicine, passing them by and not being as their best active self. 
Um, and so we hope these are tools that were helpful. Um, and again, thank you so much, Kelly, for participating today. Thank you. This was really great.